So you may have noticed, as, um, as you might have been looking in the layers, so last week we went through the workflow of first um, adding a store pointing to a given uh, data file on, your, on the system. So that store points to that data file and then makes it available for creating layers. For each layer that you produce, you then have the option of linking a given style to that layer. So let me, let me show you what that looks like. So if we go into our layers here, and we can choose, oh, let's see. Here is the states shape file. So this is a layer name called states. This is one of the default uh, data sets that comes with GeoServer. And we focused primarily last week on this, um, this data tab, looking at the various options that you have for defining the EPSG code for the spatial reference system, then forcing the system to compute the bounding boxes. This is all information that goes into the get capabilities response for this particular layer. And then looking at the, the various fields associated with this, um, this data set. These field names become important when you're starting to develop new styles. Because especially if you're wanting to do something beyond sort of generic, take all the polygons and color them in a particular way, as soon as you start wanting to um, look at the values in a particular field and use those values to determine how particular polygons should be rendered, um, you're going to need to know those polygon names, those, uh, those attribute names to set up those rules. So here, this is where you can, you can see the names of all of the what are called properties in GeoServer. Those are those attribute names from the vector data set. Today we're going to look at this publishing tab. And in particular, we're going to scroll down to the area where we have options related to the style. So GeoServer comes with a set of styles by default. And they are fairly generic. And some of them are also designed as pretty much examples that you can then work from. In this case, there's a default style. And you define a default style for every layer that, that you have in the system. So you may not realize it, but when you create a new uh, data set, a new layer, it is going to be assigned a default style. And again, that style is generic. In this case, this particular layer has been assigned the population default style out of the list of available styles that GeoServer has in the system. And that population style is based on, uh, based on an attribute that is um, encoded in that style. And we'll take a look at that style in just a moment. And you can see then this is actually a legend that has been automatically generated for that layer based on that <laughs> style. You can advertise other styles as being available for any given layer, which actually then show up in the get capabilities response for that layer. So when you're doing a WMS get capabilities request, you can see what uh, other style names are available. You know that styles parameter in WMS that we have nearly always been leaving blank to, in, our, in our various requests? This is where you can actually put in the name of a style that is supported by that server, by that layer, um, for changing how that layer is displayed in the map image that is returned to you. We can add, you can see over here that we already have two additional styles that are attached to this layer. This polygon style, which is truly generic, and then also this population hatch or pop hatch style. Since this is one of the example uh, layers that came with GeoServer, they had already included also sample styles 
that are defined in a manner consistent with this particular layer. So we have two additional styles that have been added over here. And if I wanted to add a third one, something like this you know, giant polygon style, I just highlight it in the list here of available styles. I click on the arrow, and it get, then gets added to the selected styles area over here. So once I've chosen the, st the default style and any additional styles that I want to link to it, the layer that we've created, I save my changes. And thanks. Oh, do I have to reconnect to the network? Oh, okay. I'll only have to reconnect after I've been using it for a few minutes. <laughs> Let's now go to the layer preview and see how this shows up in the, um, the options that were provided in the layer preview. And let's see, that was, was it the top states? Is that the one I was just working with? Maybe, let's see. We'll know in a minute because I just added that additional style. So this is what a, a styled layer looks like. And if I expand the menu options up here, we can see some of the um, additional uh, possibilities that are available for this particular uh, layer based on the settings that we've applied to that layer in, in, its, in its configuration. So if I can go over here to the styles and I can see in addition to the default, which is, um, the, the one that is set up that is set up for this this layer and I think it was called population we can then also choose the generic polygon style which as you can see is quite generic um, this is typically the style that's going to be applied automatically to any new polygon layers that you create so if you don't actually go to that publication tab for the layer it will already have this polygon style as the default. So that's why you're seeing those sort of generic polygon maps when you preview your layers. We can also then look at the giant polygon, which is only slightly different. <laughs> and we can then go to the population hatch or pop hatch polygon, where again, this is a style that has been defined and given a name and we, it's then been linked to this layer as one of the available styles that you can use for any WMS request for this layer. So this is how the styles play out in the map images that are delivered as a part of the WMS. Let's now go to the styles themselves. So over here, in the left-hand side, you have a, a menu item for styles. This is where all of the styles that, have been, that are available in the system are made available. And this is where you also go to create any new style. So you'll see there's this add new style button up here. And we'll, we'll go through that process in just a few minutes. In this case, let's start by looking at the polygon style. This is that incredibly generic gray polygon style that we looked at um, just a moment ago. So if I click on this, it brings up the style editor. And in this case, this is a global style that it's warning us cannot, cannot be modified by a non-administrator. But here we're just essentially looking at it as an example. It has a name. It has a workspace, but in this case we can't change it, so it, it is not editable. We could actually make a copy of this. Oh, actually, it won't even let us make a copy of it in this case. Um, but here, this is the entire style. And as I highlighted in the lecture, you actually have a fair amount of XML sort of structural stuff. All of this is that XML header for the SLD. So this is going to be common to every styled layer descriptor file that you generate. And then you have essentially this, um, this closing styled layer descriptor element down here. 
Your style itself is the core of the definition of this very basic style, where we're giving it a name, so it can actually be referred to by name, giving it a title, so that would actually show up in um, the generation, in the automatic generation of, say, layers, or, or, or I should say map le legends, um, some abstract information. This is differentially used. It really depends on the client that's, that's using or reading this styled layer descriptor information. Um, this is also information that may very well show up in the get capabilities request and the information about the various styles. And we eventually get down to our feature type style and rule element. And this is where we start to get into the meat and potatoes of the definition of the style. Where the name of our, of our rule is creatively named rule one. It's given a title. Again, this is used by some clients to display a, a, a human readable description of what this rule represents as the abstract provides a slightly more, more verbose description of the style. And then we get into the symbolizer. This, as I discussed in the lecture, is where you are actually defining the rendering of polygons using this style. Where we have two components here in the symbolizer. We're first defining the fill and in this case, the fill has one, one element in it. It's the CSS parameter, which is basically a selector, much like you would think of a CSS selector in your HTML that you've been working with. This is saying you're need, you need to um, basically take this value, uh, name equals fill, and assign this style to it. So it's, it's, it, they've sort of borrowed some terminology from cascading style sheets in the naming of this element. The key here is this name equals fill. And this is where looking at the documentation for the styled layer descriptor comes in, where you can look at your options for the different values that you can assign to this name to figure out what values you can set for this, uh, the fill of this, of this polygon. In this case, this is a hexadecimal representation of a shade of gray. So it's, it's that combination, you know, as you've, as you've perhaps been thinking about choosing colors in your style sheets for your web, web pages, these are the same color specifications you can use here, where essentially the, the, you have three pairs of letters or numbers that range from 00, zero to FF, essentially giving you 16 values that you can represent uh, through that, um, that combination of, of two characters, ranging from essentially uh, total dark darkness to total lightness. When they're all the same, so this is red, the first two characters correspond to red, if I can select only the first two, that's the intensity of red. The next two correspond to the intensity of green, and the final two correspond to the intensity of blue. So if these are all Fs, essentially you have um, white. If they're all zeros, you have black. If they're all the same across, uh, across between zeros and Fs, they're gonna be different shades of gray. Otherwise, if you have different values for each of those pairs, you're going to end up with a mixture of red, green, and blue that produce a unique color. So that's how you define those colors. We're also defining the stroke here um, with two values. First is the stroke width represented by this stroke, or the stroke color, I should say, represented by this name equals stroke. And it's that same model for defining the color. And then we also then have this name equals stroke width, where we're defining the width of the stroke or for the boundaries of those polygons in pixels. So here you're working in units of pixels. 
And that's it. For defining this simple rule, we have a gray fill, we have a gray stroke, a lighter stroke, and then we have a very narrow stroke width. And then we've got a whole bunch of XML opening and closing tags surrounding all of this stuff. One of the things that you should do, and it doesn't show up here, but when we create or modify a, a, um, a, a style, there will be an option to validate, which we'll do right now. So let's now create a new style based on one of the existing styles that we have here. So I want to add a new style. And it'll bring up this, this dialog here. And I'm going to call this my test style 01. And I'm going to put it in my test student workspace. And I could just start typing in a style, a SLD right here. I could also copy and paste it in from another location, another web page, or my local computer. In this case, I'm actually going to copy an existing style. So I'm going to copy that polygon. So I choose it from the list and choose copy. So now it's automatically added all the definition of that existing style into my editor here. And since this isn't one of the global styles that only administrators are allowed to edit, I can actually modify it. And I can just do something as simple as saying, I want my fill to be red, some shade of red. So I'm going to zero out the green and the blue by just putting zeros in. I'll leave the A there, so it's not going to be quite the highest intensity of red, but it'll be still pretty darn red. And maybe I want my stroke color to be blue. So maybe I'll add a couple of A's here to define, again, a very low intensity of red and green and a high intensity of blue. And, I'll, and I'm now ready to experiment with it. Something you should always do if you've been editing or adding a new style is click on this validate button. Because what that's going to do is confirm that your style sheet is both structurally valid as XML and that it is also valid against the SLD schema. So it's going to basically tell you whether or not your style is broken. It doesn't necessarily mean that it ha doesn't have some logical errors when you start getting to, into more complex styles where you're using uh, some filter conditions or other, other rules, but the validation will at least check to make sure it's structurally sound and that you're compliant with the SLD specification. And the message will show up here at the top where it says no validation errors after you validate it. You want to make sure that that's the case. So once I validated it, I can submit it. I now have, if I, if I look in my styles list, here's my test style 01. That's the style that I just created. I can now add that style to a layer. So let's go back to our layers and we can go to that, uh, was it Taz States? Or, or uh, let's see, what was it? Yeah, here we go. So if we go to States again, go to Publishing. We can now go down to our available styles, and you'll now see that my test style is available in that list of styles that I can choose from. I can then add that to the list of selected styles over here. And maybe while I'm here, I would also maybe add that population style so it shows up by name as a, as a named style that you can choose. It's already the default style, but you may have noticed that that population, our default style name, did not show up in the list of available styles in the open layers preview. By adding that population style here, it's also going to be advertised as a named style as opposed to just the default way that that layer is going to be displayed. So I've added that style. I can hit save.
And now I can go to my layer preview and look at that top states, look at it in our open layers preview. So the default style is the same. I can open up the menu, the area up here to see the various options. I can now choose, oops. You know, this sometimes happens. Let me refresh this. Sometimes it caches the information. There we go. So it was retaining the information that had previously been used to populate the preview. So by forcing the browser to refresh the preview, I was basically telling it to reread the information from the server to, uh, to show me my options here. So that is something that you may run into where you can make a change but it doesn't show up in your preview. Try to refresh it and hopefully it'll come up. So you'll see that population now shows up as we added that as a named style that's on the list. And here's our, my test style 01. So if I choose that, we get nothing. Dang it. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Let's try this one more time. Okay, fine. <laughs> Let's take a look take a look back at that style in spite of the fact that I was able to validate it, see if there's anything that I did to it that is not clear and that the validator didn't catch. All I did was change the color here, that looks good, and the color here, that looks good. I did the same thing as you and it worked for me. I'm just lucky that way. <laughs> with, a, with a different style? Yeah, I tried James' test style, and this is what I, I did, it's the exact same thing. Okay, let's, uh, so let me go back to my layer and go back to my states layer. Go back to my states layer and we'll add the James test style to that layer. We'll get rid of this one for the moment. We'll save that. We'll go to our layer preview. So we go to our top states layer again. Let's refresh it just on general principle. So now we've got James state style and it still doesn't work for me. Hmm. So somehow yours is, it's, it's magic on your computer but not on mine. <laughs> As seems to be my luck when the, with these live demonstrations. So here's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> So you have lovely blue bo blue borders and red fill, or did you use different yeah, colors? Uh, blue borders, red well, there you go. That's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> um, so there you go. Now let's look at a more complex style. Looking at the uh, population style. So this is one that it are, did also come with the system. This is another global style that we can't edit here. But you could actually make a new style and copy this to that new style and then have your way with it. Um, in this case, we now start to see, in addition to the standard, um, standard rules, we now see this filter condition where we're setting some, some parameters where we're saying we want to test that, in this case, the person's property is less than 
a value that we're providing here. So this is defining the conditions under which this rule will be applied. So only for features that have persons of less than 2 million will this polygon symbolizer be used. Where, in this case, we're defining a particular fill color and an opacity for that fill. Other than that, it's using the default uh, settings for, that, for rendering that polygon. Here we have a second rule right here where we're now using a property is between test. So now we're looking at a condition where this person's property is between 2 million and 4 million where we're defining those values inside this lower boundary and upper boundary element. So this is how you can essentially produce what in reality is some of the most, most verbose logical testing you'll ever encounter. Um, but that's what XML brings you. Um, but this is a way where you can start to create these rules so that you can differentially symbolize um, parts of, of a data set that meet your criteria. So for those polygons that meet this condition of the number of persons being between two and four million, this polygon symbolizer is going to be used with a different color and actually the same opacity. We have another rule where the property is greater than persons in four million and then a different color again. And then we're defining a boundary down here that in this case is setting the entire, uh, uh, the, both actually the boundary stroke and then we're defining a text symbolizer as well for the labeling. You'll remember that that default population style actually was, was providing labels for the states as well. Um, and this is the text symbolizer that is defining the various attributes of the, that labeling. So this is a good style to look at for an example of how to structure one of these more complicated um, filter-based uh, styles that you may want to think about repurposing for your own, your own work. But Something that might even be easier is to use a tool like Quantum GIS to be able to use its interface to essentially develop and preview what a style looks like and then save that style and either upload it or copy and paste it into GeoServer. So let's switch over to Quantum GIS where in this case I, act, I have here a census data set. Let's zoom in. So this is a census data set that I downloaded from the US Census Bureau that has just a boatload of different attributes for each state. So if I open this up, I can look at the attribute table for this shape file that I brought into Quantum GIS, and I can see that I have an incredible range of entirely cryptic column names <laughs> that we have access to for be able, being able to create a style, uh, for being able to essentially define how these data will be rendered. And this is the exact same process you would go through in Quantum GIS for just doing your own cartographic work for any layers that you have in QGIS as you define how you want the different features to be rendered. It's just that one of the options that Quantum GIS provides is an option to export the style that you've created as an OGC styled layer descriptor file that you can then use wherever or however you want. So here, I was looking at the documentation or some of the documentation for 
this, this data set. And in this case, what the Census Bureau does is they provide a, an Excel spreadsheet that's embedded in the, in the zip file that you download which is with the shape file. And that is highly legible. <laughs> Basically, it's the field names and then some descriptive information about all the fields in this table, which helps you to then decrypt what those various field names are. So in this case, I've actually used the rental vacancy rate as, as the field that I'm using for my classification, which is DP0200001. That's the, that's the column name in the data set. So for example, if I was wanting to develop a map that might help me as an investor in rental properties to figure out the states with, say, the lowest vacancy rates, where I might actually have a prospect of making some money with a rental property that I wanted to create, I could generate a map that symbolizes in some, some way the differential rental rates or rental vacancy rates nationwide. Here, th that's essentially what I've done. I've opened up the properties for this particular layer, and I've gone to the style uh, tab in the properties for this layer. And I've chosen what column I want to use for this particular, um, for the, for this particular rendering of the state polygons. And this is where the documentation for quantum GIS will be helpful to you in terms of walking through all of the options that you have for creating styles in quantum GIS, both for any you know, cartographic work you want to do in QGIS, but also potentially for being able to generate these style sheets. Here, I chose that column that corresponds to that vacancy rate, and I selected uh, basically a categorized uh, rule, and I chose a particular color ramp. Let's change it instead from this shades from white to blue. Let's change it instead to, uh, let's say, red to gray. And I can then click on the classify button. And actually, I may need to first delete all my now let me try the classification again. There we go. So here, it automatically did a classification for me. And, uh, and basically applying that color ramp to the various classes that it was defining based on the different value ranges. I can then apply this to my map. And you can see here, you know, if I'm looking for states to maybe invest in rental property in, Looks like Alaska is a hot ticket. Um, <laughs> California, Oregon, and uh, you know some some locations in the Northeast. Uh, Texas, not so much. <laughs> so here, I've now created, and I've been able to preview a style of how the polygons can be rendered um, in QGIS. And I can continue to tune this up in terms of you know, choosing you know, different, different uh, fill methods, solid fills, or hashing, or all of that. We're going to keep it simple at this point. And I can just say, OK, I'm ready to move on. But in this case, I want to instead click on the Save Style button here. And you have two options. I can save it as a QGIS uh, style file. Or I can save it as an SLD. So I choose SLD, and it brings up a dialog box where I can then give it a name and tell it where I want to save it. In this case, I've already created this first one. So let's just give this one, say, an O2 to represent my second styled layer descriptor file. And say OK. I now have an SLD file on my local hard drive that I can, that I can work on getting up into uh, GeoServer. The easiest way to do it is to actually just copy and paste it into a new style. You could 
copy it to the server. So I could, if I click on add new style here, if I go down to the bottom, I can choose a file. Oh, actually I can upload a file too. I, that seems to be a new addition. Oops, let me choose, let me see if I can. So in this case, I actually can choose a file to upload. I think that's, that's somewhat new from previous versions I've worked with. So I can go here, I can go to the directory where I saved where I saved that styled layer descriptor file. This is even better than copying and pasting it. So I have this folder called census data. And here's that second SLD file. So I can click on open and upload. So you can see now it has actually added it to the editor here. And I can choose to, again, to put it in my test student workspace. I can validate it. I can scroll back to the top of the screen and see that there are no validation errors. And then submit it. Now we can keep my fingers crossed and see if I can successfully add it to a layer. I, before class, I added that state census file to the server. So that's this uh, state 2010 census DP1 uh, layer that, that, um, that I created earlier. I can go to publishing for that file. You can see the, uh, the default style is one that I, that I actually uploaded earlier based on that shades of blue SLD as I was testing to make sure everything worked the way I wanted it to. Perhaps I even would just change my default style now to be this new one that I uploaded, but I would maybe make the, uh, let's see, was it my test style 01? No. Oh no, it's, it's KB Census State 01. So I already have it over here over the, under the selected styles. I can choose save. And now I can go to my layer preview. Go to that, that layer. So that's this state 2010 census DP1. Open that up and open layers. And you can see now that SLD that I had set up as the default is showing up as the rendering for this. And I can theoretically choose that blue one as an alternative. And these would, um, that would show up as a named style that could be used in, that, in the WMS request to the service that's advertised here. Um, or you could just get the default style by leaving that styles parameter empty in a WMS request. We didn't look at that style. Let's take a look at that style so you can see what, as you might guess, that more complex style looks like. It was automatically generated for us by, uh, by Quantum GIS. So I think it was, no, it wasn't that one. Right here, here it is. As it thinks about it. Here we have this named layer, user style, and then we start to get into the rules. Where we have a, a name and a description where the description is basically just the value that is going to go into the um, map legend that is automatically generated by GeoServer for this particular um, element of a, a set of features. Here we have a filter condition where we're saying property is equal to and we're, and we're saying 5.5. Then we're defining the actual uh, polygon symbolizer here, and we're getting to the end of the rule. Then we get down to 6.3, and again, property is equal to, 
In this case, the rule that I set up, since it was a classification rule in, in um, QGIS, is basically taking each distinct value and assigning a color to it in increasing order. So it took then the 6.3 and is setting up a, fil a, a filter and then a different polygon symbolizer all the way down for each one of those classes in the, the, um, the, feature, in the feature class. So you can see this is, this is quite a long one that would have been kind of a pain to generate for yourself. Um, and even if you had tried to copy and paste and modify the blocks, the likelihood of actually messing up in some way is probably relatively high. So using something like QGIS to generate that, that style that you may want to then, you know, even bring into GeoServer to tune up is a really nice and convenient way to start.